our Bibles, the time we have remaining, Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 to 29. Matthew 26, verses 26 to 29. Jesus Christ, our example of self-denial. Stand with me if you would. Follow along as I read God's Word. If you don't have a Bible with you, we've got the text on the screen. I'd be glad to provide a Bible if you need one. Just see me after the service. This is in the midst of that night we were just talking about. As they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. He took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. What have we just read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May the Lord help us today to see in these words of Jesus in verse 29 His tremendous example to us of self-denial and learn from it how we ourselves as his followers do well to practice and follow his example. Thank you. Please be seated. We've read these words together. I've referenced them to you dozens of times through the years. And I've remarked every time how, how shocking and, and it is to me, just gripping it is to me that when Jesus would ascend back to heaven, having completed his Father's will, having once again been enthroned at the right hand of God, surrounded by angels committed to serving him without end, having earned the Father's pleasure by his suffering and dying and rising again, that he would deny himself in heaven. It is a mystery to me. It's amazing to me. It grips me and it challenges me in new and fresh ways every time I think about it. That my Savior, who is worthy to be worshipped by all the angelic hosts, by people from every tribe and tongue and nation under heaven, and one day will be by such who has earned every right, every privilege by his sinless life, his vicarious substitutionary death, bearing in himself our sin, enduring God's wrath for sin, suffering and dying in our place, conquering by rising from the grave, conquering sin and death and hell and the grave, that he would deny himself. Peter says that Jesus Christ has set us an example. It's, a, it's one of those compound words in the original language, uh, which literally means writing under. I've told you about this before, but I, just want, I want to share it again. You and I learned our ABCs. Our, our, our grandson Davis is, uh, is now... He's living, living with us for a little while, and he's got these laminated sheets that his mom has for them with the, with the letters, and you know the letters, they're dotted, little dash, dash, dash that forms an A in the day, and he is now practicing every day, going over those, going over those, and he goes over them and over them, and then at the right time, he drops to the line beneath it. You remember this? You did this? And he makes his own A. 
That's the picture there. It's literally the writing under. Jesus has set us an example that we, that we trace his life. We trace his life. We go over it and over it and over it. And it's interesting as you watch Davis, and if you're doing this with your own children now, you know what I'm talking about. Kind of almost a little bit of a squiggly <laughs> beginning there and a squiggly down. He, he covers the tracing. It's, and then the more he does it, the lines become more solid, more solid. And then he does it on his own, good, solid, straight lines for A, and then the rounding for B, and so on and so forth. That's the, that's the picture. Jesus set our example. He said in John 13, leading up to, just, just not many minutes or hours before this event, Passover transformed to communion, when he washed their feet, I've, I've, I've left you an example and you should follow me. You call me your master and your rabbi, and you're right because I am. But if I, your master and your rabbi, if I wash your feet, how much more should you wash one another's feet? So what do we see here? What do we to learn here? I want us to just to briefly see three things today. This is, this is not a typical exposition so much as it is a reflection upon this occasion of the Lord's Supper. I want us to see three things in this, in this verse. First, he's our example of self-denial because in denying himself, in denying himself the comforts of daily life. Secondly, in demonstrating that earth is not our final home. And third, in declaring that there is a glorious reunion coming. Look at this verse. Verse 29, he says, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. He's denying himself the comforts of daily life. And it's not like Jesus had had an easy life on earth. He says at one point, you know, the, the birds have a nest, the foxes have a hole in the ground. The Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He, had, he did not have the common comforts, even of the people in, in whose midst he came, that they could go home. Because, you see, he was, he was not home. <laughs> the whole time he was here, he was not home. He didn't have an easy life. He was, he was misunderstood by his own uh, half siblings. At points his mother misunderstood. At one point his siblings said he, he's demon possessed. The religious leaders despised him. He threatened them at every turn and they, they plotted and planned his destruction. His own, the closest to him, would let him down time and time again. So when you, when you assert that he's denying himself the comforts of daily life, they were precious few comforts. You see, we recognize drinking this little cup of juice and eating this bread is, is, is the symbolic Lord's Supper. But in Jesus' day, having access to the fruit of the vine was, was rare. It wasn't common. The drinking water they had was not safe, generally. So he's not simply saying, though it's powerful, that he says, I'm not going to do this again until I have all of you with me. That, that's gripping enough. But I'm going to turn aside from comforts that he could legitimately claim. It's it. You see, it's not sinful for Jesus to drink of the fruit of the vine. And yet he's telling them, I'm not going to do this again. You see, he has, he has a work that's looming We need to recognize that. He had to sweat the bloody sweat. The drops of sweat that were tears, that, that were, there was blood coming from his vessels burst in his forehead. He would stand accused before Pilate, beaten and bloody. And Herod, the same. He would bear a cross. Though nearly beaten to death, he would bear a cross. 
through Jerusalem's malicious crowds. His hands would be offered to have nails driven through them. His feet, the same. A crown of thorns, though he was worthy of the most precious crown ever crafted. A crown of thorns pressed upon him. He had a great weight coming. At one point he said, I have a baptism to be baptized with. And I am straightened. In other words, I am, I am pressed, squeezed until it is accomplished. So he says to them that night, I'm putting away earthly comforts. No more, no more comfort for me. I'm fixed on the cross. We need to recognize his example here and learn ourselves not to let the comforts of this earth keep us, distract us, hinder us from doing the will of God. There, there are plenty of the, the martyrs. <laughs> the martyrs laid down their lives upon the altar because Christ's cause demanded. And they still do. We, we mentioned our brothers and sisters in Christ in Bangladesh today. And probably before the week is out, we may not get the report before the week is out, some follower of Jesus Christ will die. Pay the ultimate price for being identified with Jesus. We don't need to see his denying himself here, and we shouldn't treat as, as thinking he's better than others or looking down upon food. That's not... See, I see people saying they're practicing self-denial. That's not it at all. Self-denial is I'm going to deny myself of anything I can legitimately claim that will stand in the way of my love and service and devotion to Jesus Christ. We have to check it all the time. It changes all the time. It can be relationships. We deny ourselves certain relationships because they bring us down. They take us backward. They do not strengthen our resolve to follow Christ. Opportunities possessions, things. He did this not only because he had a great work facing him, but because he had a great love for us. He's constrained by love, the Scripture says. The love of Christ constrains. Out of his love for us, he gave up all. We should practice that example. There's sometimes when our love for him our love for others, as our, as our church statement says, will cause us to give up, to deny, to turn away from. Secondly, I want you to see that he's an example of self-denial for us in demonstrating that earth is not our final home. We should enjoy life while we have life to enjoy, but we should be careful that we do not act as if this is all there is. Because we live around people every day for whom this is all there is. And they should see in us that we're headed somewhere. To a city whose builder and maker is God, a house not made with human hands in the heavens. That we're headed, as we sing, I'm bound for the promised land. Who will come and go with me? I'm bound for the promised land. Our sights are set upon him. We're looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We're laying aside every weight, Hebrews says, and the sin that so easily entangles us that we might run with endurance and finish the race marked out for us. Earth is not our final home. We sing, a, we sing in the past a gospel a song, This world is not my home, I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. I just don't feel at home in this world anymore. I don't know about you. Some of you in here are younger than I am. But the older I get, the less I feel at home. The more I want to be home, truly home. Third thing he shows us. And self-denial is declaring that there is a glorious reunion coming. And this is so critical. You see, when he says to them, 
I will not take of the fruit of the vine, drink of this anymore till, till you're gathered with me. It's, he doesn't say this in a glum way. Because see, there's this, until that day is in there. For Jesus' self-denial promised a more glorious experience. I know some people who think of self-denial as, oh my goodness, you mean I've got to give up this and I've got to give up that. Uh, I, I, I chuckle inside when, when sometimes professing Christians say, you mean I have to, I have to, I have to, like a guy said years ago to me, he said, you mean you tell me I have to go to church to be a Christian? I said, I've never known a real Christian who had to go to church. Every Christian I know is like, has the heart of the psalmist. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. We have, we have little grandchildren living with us now for a brief season, and, and we get up and on Sunday mornings, and it's church day. Oh, it's church day. It's church day. And we sing, I like to go to church. I like to go to church. I like the happy songs we sing. I like to go to church because it is, it is the queen of days. It's the best of days. You see, there's a better prospect until that day when I drink it new with you. <laughs> My father's going he would teach us to approach self-denial that way. Not as sad sacks. He scolded the Pharisees. He said, you guys fast, but everybody in the world knows you're fasting because your faces are, are long and drawn out. To deny ourselves, as Jesus showed us, means to be joyful in the denial who for the joy set before him endured the cross. When we think right about heaven, when we think right about how this is not our final home, but there is a final home for us. When we face our sin, our remaining sin, that we yield to the temptations of sin and we, we, we're pressed on every side and we're sinned against, we think of heaven where there is no sin where I will be there by God's grace without sin. I won't have any remaining sin in me. True freedom. Think about the precious, true freedom that is ours in Christ and ultimately and completely and absolutely ours in Christ where in heaven I will not have any sin myself. There will be no sinful options. Totally absent of sin. The glory of it. And being with the Savior and being with the saints. I don't know how we'll do it. My mind can't wrap around it. But think about celebrating with a numberless multitude and recognizing, recognizing Peter in that, recognizing Paul, recognizing Barnabas, recognizing Isaiah, recognizing Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, rep recognizing Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, recognizing Spurgeon. I, I could go on and on, knowing as we are known and celebrating all of that together. Jesus said, I'm going to deny myself until the day. And we should practice that kind of self-denial too. Be willing, gladly giving up what we can claim rightfully as ours, but for a greater cause, for a more wonderful and splendid existence. It's interesting to me, the passage we read from Philippians, said he did not think his equality with God to be something to be grasped onto. In other words, Jesus was not kicked out of heaven, kicking and screaming. He was, he was not clinging to, to his prerogative as the, as the eternal Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, with all the rights and privileges there. No, he, he, he gave himself up. He emptied himself of everything that he could call his. He didn't give up his deity, but he gave up a lot of prerogatives of deity. And it says, let this mindset be in you. But then, facing what he was facing that night, I'm impressed that he did not cling to that night. They didn't say, I don't want this night to end. I don't want to go to do what I have to do. No, not our Savior. He went from there resolute, knowing that for a season, the Father whom he loved 
the father whose, whose darling he is would turn himself away from him. That he would experience something that in all of eternity he had never experienced and has never experienced since. And that was the turning away of the father from him. And knowing that, he didn't shriek back. But for you and for me who love him, he went to that. He didn't even cling to earth when he was about to face hell on earth. What an example we have in our Savior. Will we follow it? Will we be like him? Romans 8 says that God works all things together for good to those who love him, who are called according to his purpose, so that we might be conformed to the image of his Son. We might increasingly take on Christ-like properties. And that will not come through self-indulgence. It will only come through sanctified self-denial. May the Lord help us to be such people. And I know that in saying that, I'm speaking to some here who are not yet followers of Jesus Christ. And please know that we don't look down on any of you because there was a time when I was not yet a follower of Jesus Christ. And somebody loved me. Somebody was patient with me. But what I would say to you is consider this precious Savior who loves sinners so much that he left the splendor of heaven to come and die for ones like you. And all he asks of you, we, we sing a hymn, Come ye sinners, poor and needy, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pity, love, and power. And one of the lines in that hymn says, Do not let conscience make you linger. In other words, <laughs> don't say, Well, I'm, I'm not worthy. Don't let conscience make you linger. And it goes on and says, Nor of fitness fondly dream. Don't think, well, well, when I get myself together, when I get my life together, when I get things sorted up. No, he said all the fitness he requires is to feel your need of him. And then it goes on and says, and this, even your need of him, this he gives you. It's the Spirit's rising beam. In other words, it's evidence of the Spirit working in your life if you feel your need of Jesus. So I appeal to you today. On this day that we've celebrated, the memorial meal of, of the Savior, I encourage you to celebrate His life, death, burial, and resurrection for you by repenting of your sin and trusting in Him as God's solution to your sin. Let's pray. Dear Holy